question 17 says a transformer is used to convert 240 volts to 12 volts in order to power a table lamp if the current in the primary coil is 0 0.2 amps what is the current in the secondary coil assume that the transformer is ideal so if a transformer is used to convert 240 volts to 12 volts in order to power a table lamp the current trans the current in the primary coil is 0 0.2, 0 0.2 amps what is the current in the secondary coil assume that the transformer is ideal so let's look at it together I've lost my pen okay so let's work on it together so we've been told to say so we've got um with the voltage in the primary we've got the voltage in the secondary so the voltage in the primary in the primary is this first one that we have so the voltage in the primary is 240 volts and the voltage in the secondary is the voltage that is being out given out which is in the output which is 12 volts so that's the voltage in the secondary um and what else do we have? We also have a current in the primary, current in the secondary. So in the primary, are we given the, the current? Yes, we've been given 0 0.2 as a current in the primary, 0 0.2 amps. And now we're looking for the current in the secondary. So we'll leave that as question mark. So by ratios, the voltage in the primary over the voltage in the secondary should be equal to the current in the primary divided by the current in the secondary and we can replace this with what we have there so for vp we've got 240 over 12 volts volts equal to ip we've got 0 0.2 a over is which is what we're looking for we leave it as is so we can cross multiply going to have 240 volts multiplied by is is equal to 12 volts multiplied by 0 0.2 amps okay so multiplied by 0 0.2 amps 12 multiplied by 0 0.2 amps um, we are getting 12 multiplied by 0 0.2 is giving us 2.4 so we've got 2.4 this is v a and on this side we've got um two i s multiplied by 240 volts we can divide both sides by 240 we're going to have i s equals 2.4 v a divided by 240 v the V and that V do cancel and we get 2.4 divided by 240 that is giving us 0 0.01 so the current in the secondary is equal to 0 0.01 amps so that is our answer and that is A so question 17 our answer is A we can move on to question 18 okay question 18 says which part of the cathode ray oscilloscope helps the emitted electrons to come together to form a fine fiber. Which part of the cathode ray oscilloscope helps the emitted electrons to come together to form to form a fine to form a fine beam? Sorry, sorry. Let me let me just read that again. Which part of the cathode ray oscilloscope helps the emitted electrons to come together to form a fine beam sorry yeah which part of the cathode ray oscilloscope helps the emitted, emitted electrons to form a fine beam we've got a the control grid control grid b the cathode c the anode and d the x splits so which one helps us to form um, a fine beam which one helps us to form a fine beam so we've got the control grid, we've got the cathode and the anode and the x-plates. So when we talk of x-plates, x-plates are simply plates that help to, to center, to, to direct the, the emitted electrons 
um, into a fine beam. So basically, our answer for question 18 is the X splits. These direct and help to, 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 to form, help to, to guide the electrons into a beam that they can, or into a path that they can, they can go through. So we've got the X plates and the Y plates. So the X plates help in that, and the Y plates as well help in that. So we've, we've got beams, we've got plates that are like that, and plates that are like that. These are forming a boundary in the upper, in the, in the vertical. These are forming the boundary in the horizontal. Okay, move on to question 19. Question 19 says the diagram shows the structure of an atom of carbon, with that structure. What is the nuclide mutation of this atom? So, if we can see clearly, we've got 6p, p is the protons, so 6 protons, 8n, which is the neutrons, and we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 electrons. So, this, um, this, this, this atom that we have has got 8, neutron, eight neutrons, 6 protons, and 6 electrons. So, the, new, the the mass number of this of this um, of this of this of this atom that we have is simply what we have in the nu nucleus there, and the atomic number is simply the number of protons or the number of electrons because it's the same. So we have eight plus six, which is giving us fourteen, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have fourteen and six. So fourteen and six is what we have in our option C. So the answer is C. Question 20 says, a radioactive substance has a mass of 100 grams and a half-life of two minutes. How much of this substance remains undecayed after six minutes? A radioactive substance has a mass of 100 grams and a half-life of two minutes. How much of this substance remains undecayed after six minutes? So. In the first one minute, or rather in the first two minutes, what we are starting off with is 100 grams. And every after two minutes, half of it goes. So after two minutes, after two minutes, we're going to have, after two minutes, we're going to have, we're going to have half of, five, of 100 is 50. So after two minutes, we're going to have 50 grams. After another two minutes, we're going to have, we are going to have half of 50, which is 25 grams. After another two minutes, we are going to have, after another two minutes, we're going to have half of 25 is 12.5 grams. Okay, so two, four, six. So after the first two minutes, 50, after the second two minutes, 25, and after the third two minutes, we'll have 12.5. So our answer in this case is 12.5 grams. Okay. So we're done with the physics part and we can move on to the chemistry part of this paper. Okay. So we continue with the chemistry part of this science 2011 paper one. So chemistry starts from question number 21. And that question says, Study the diagram below showing the arrangement of particles during the change of state of matter. Study the diagram below showing the arrangement of particles during the change of state of matter. We've got A, we've got B, we've got, uh, we've got change A, we've got change B, we've got change C, and we've got change D. So as you can see, A, the particles are closely arranged, which means that this is a solid. A solid has got its particles closely and tightly arranged. We've got this part, well, this point, which has got the particles loosely arranged, but they are still together. Uh, this is showing a liquid. And we've got B, or rather the, the, last, the last phase, where the particles are each far away from each other. This is showing a gas, because gases have their particles that are really free and are not close together. So the question says, which process A, B, C, or D, shown in the diagram, does ammonium chloride undergo when heated? So what type of change does ammonium chloride uh, go through when heated? So first we need to identify what state ammonium chloride is and what happens to it after it is heated. What state does it change to 
upon heating. So ammonium chloride is a solid and upon heating it doesn't change to liquid, it changes directly to gas and that process is known as sublimation. So a change of um, a, 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 a material from um, solid to gas without going through the the, the liquid state is known as sublimation. So ammonium chloride changes from solid to gas, and this is denoted by process C. So our answer on number 21 is C. Okay, move on to number 22. Number 22 says, the diagram below shows apparatus used to carry out fractional distillation. We've got this whole apparatus, we've got this whole process that is happening there. And it says which part labeled A, B, C, or D represents a fraction. So this is what we have. Uh, these are the beads. We've got a thermometer there, we've got a light bead condenser, and we've got uh, what we are collecting in D. So what we're collecting is only a fraction of what we initially had in A. So our answer, these are beads, this is a fractionating column. Oh, sorry, this is... This is a light B condenser, and um, A is what we, we initially are starting out with. So what we have in D is only a fraction of what we have in A. So hence, what we have in D is known as a fraction. So our answer for this question is D. Go to question 23. Which of the following particles has almost the same mass as a neutron? Which of the following particles has almost the same mass as a neutron? We've got an electron, a proton, sodium ion, and an alpha particle. Okay, so um, the question is explicitly says to say atomic particles. So when you talk of sodium, sodium ion is not an atomic particle. When you talk of an alpha particle, it's not an atomic particle, which leaves us with these two, a proton and an electron. An electron has a heavier mass than both the proton and the neutron. And the proton and the neutron have almost the same mass, which are very negligible. So our answer for this question is B, which is proton. Okay, move on to question number 24. Question 24 says, which of the following is not one of the three classes of substances? Which of the following is not one of the three classes of substances? We've got A, compound, neutron, element, and mixture. Okay, so in talk of classes of substances, we mean... Uh, we mean a collection of substances or what, what can we call it or yeah so we've got a compound neutron element and a mixture mixture is something uh, two, two or more uh, compounds or sorry two or more elements that are physically combined element is one single element is one single entity a proton or rather a neutron is found in an atom it's part of an element or a substance. A compound is one or more or two or more uh, elements or, 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 or substances that are chemically combined. So we find that one, two, three are all classes of substances. Well, this one is what makes up a substance. So we can say our answer for number 24 is B, which is neutron. Okay. We move on to question number 25. The formula for copper... Copper 1 oxide is the formula for copper 1 oxide is. So here's um, a periodic table. Now ask to find the formula for copper 1 oxide. So what we need to, to figure out first are the valences of both copper 1 and also oxygen. So oxygen, which is here, is in the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Seven, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six. In the sixtieth uh, period, in the sixtieth period, and um, copper is there. So meaning it 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 has varying valences depending on the copper that you're dealing with. So we've got oxygen there. So oxygen has got two electrons in the last shell, and if oxygen has two electrons in the last shell, it means or rather it has six, meaning it needs two electrons for it to, to, to satisfy the octet true, which says that um, an element should have eight electrons or 
yeah, let's call it eight elections in the in the in the last in the last show. So oxygen needs two elections for it to be uh, a full satisfied to for for it to satisfy the octet true. And um, if it needs two elections, it means its valency is also two. Its valency is also two. Now let's come to copper one oxide. Let's come to cop copper one. Oxide. So we have agreed to say oxygen has a valency of two. So let me write it as oxygen. Sorry. Oxygen, we'll say, has a valency of two. And um, copper one oxide, copper, we'll say has, so it, since it's a one oxide, it means its valency is one as well. So copper has a valency of one. Now, we need to remember to say when you've got element A and element B. To write the formula, element A has a valency of, let's say, X, and element B has a valency of, let's say, Y. The formula will be, this uh, the valency of b will come there and the valency of x of of a will come down there so we're going to have a y b x okay so we've got copper and we've got oxygen copper has a valency of one so the one will come there oxygen has a valency of two so the two will come there so we have c u 2 o this is the formula of copper one oxide this is a formula for copper one oxide and we come to our answers which one corresponds with what we had the answer is c so the valency or the formula of copper one oxide is cu2o we come to question number 26